Hello, and welcome back to The Hills Are Alive, a movie musical podcast. I'm Alex. I'm Kelsey. And welcome back to our travel through the decades, our Uh, traverse through the decades. Through history. (laughs) Famous couples throughout history. Well, Uh, we we are talking about a famous couple today. That's true. They... Ava and Juan would have been a great costume choice and never been kissed for famous couples throughout <sighs> history prom. Maybe too, maybe too low key. Like, would high school students know? I mean, this it came out like two or three years after Evita the movie came out. I think it was a pretty big cultural touchstone at the time. Right, that's true. Well, we so, need to hit up Drew Barrymore and go back in time. And dude, speaking of, <laughs> I was just I got stuck on one of those uh, endless endless reels, you know, where you swipe up and it just plays another and another yeah, and that's, another. That's basically how TikTok and works. And like yeah. I hate it. I yeah. hate it the whole time, but I just keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Anyways, yesterday I stumbled on one from Drew Barrymore and I just Oh my god. Oh, is it her going out in the rain? Yes. <laughs> and I like I love her, but I hate her so much. Like so basically for those who haven't seen it, it's just her like in her beautiful home and then she runs out into her beautiful yard and she laughs and dances <laughs> in the rain and she says, "You guys, you have to anytime you have the chance, dance in the rain." <laughs> and she's like laughing. <laughs> Just yeah, like, yeah, I just, it's the most Drew Barrymore thing I've ever seen. Is there anything more beautiful than a beautiful flamingo flying in front of a beautiful <laughs> sunset with a beautiful rose in its beak and also you're drunk? <laughs> Wait, what? That's the Jack Handy quote. <laughs> oh, okay. It was like, I don't think Drew Barrymore said that. <laughs> It just reminded me of it. It was like in her beautiful house, in her beautiful yard, <laughs> and also you're drunk. Okay, so anyways, today we are talking about Evita. Evita, yes. The movie based on the life of Eva Peron. Mm-hmm. Um, well, based upon, it's actually, it's based upon a concept album that turned into a musical, but it's based upon the concept album. Right. And, I mean, I feel like... But it's interesting because the concept album was created in order to make the musical. Right. Um, So it's by Andrew Lloyd Webber doing the music and Mm -hmm. Tim Rice, Mm -hmm. the dream team, a dream team. Yeah. Then Um, this was um, one in a long line of collaborations that they did. I mean, they started working together basically as teenagers. So I read that the reason they went for concept album before trying to stage a musical was because they did the same thing with Jesus Christ Superstar. Right. And that's how they got that musical launched. Mm-hmm. Was they figured buzz. they could do the same thing yes. this way. Yeah, create yeah. buzz with the concept album, and that'll get enough interest going to get the musical made. And it worked, yeah, obviously. So, and, it, and it became, obviously, part of, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber's M.O. as far I mean, that's what they did with Phantom, too. Oh, wow. Did we talk about that? I don't yeah. think I knew Remember, that. Yeah, there was a concept album first. Remember they released the single... Oh, that's right, yeah. that's right, that's right, that's mm-hmm. right, that's right. Yeah, all it's right. Kind well, of, I guess it's just kind of like one part of Andrew Lloyd Webber's process, you know. I thought it was also interesting that um, Don't Cry For Me Argentina was obviously the biggest single off right. of that record, and it's the biggest single off of the soundtrack. Right. But that single off of the record was the first song from a musical ultimately from a musical, to become a number one hit on the UK charts. Wow, that's, which is interesting. Yeah. I'm, a, that surprises me. You'd think that, he, like, back in the golden era of Hollywood or whatever, you know, when musicals were huge. You would think. You would think, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll be, to be fair, I'm not sure what year that happened. I watched a little, like, BBC documentary thing, and they did mention that, but they didn't say at what point in time it became number one. Yeah. But the impression was that it became number one while it was just a well, concept album. Right. yes. Because, it, yeah, it, it wasn't... It was the the woman who recorded it just for the concept album, is, and that was the version that... Yeah, yeah, I forget her name. I don't remember what it was. I, I watched that after you, you told did, me yeah. to. Yeah. And, um, she didn't want to do it. Yeah, she didn't want to be on stage, and they, they were like, we don't really know why, but she didn't. So... 
Mm. You know? Sorry. More power to you, I guess. Yeah, whoever you are. <laughs> um, and the, and so eventually it went to, what was that woman's name? that it, um, Elaine Page. Elaine Page, yes. And she, I mean, didn't she also do Cats? Didn't she do Grisabella and Cats? I'm oh, sure that's, you're asking a lot from me. Yeah. Um, but sure, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, and, of course, Patti Lapone originated the role on Broadway. Patty. Um, and won the Tony for it. I mean, this basically swept the Tonys. Yeah. When it was so, made. So, I mean, there's a lot for us to dive in mm-hmm. when it comes to this movie. Yeah. But I'm so curious. Can you go ahead and tell us about the drama of Patti Lapone being the Broadway well, actress? Yes. And then what happened with the movie? Yes. Um, Well, I'm not sure exactly what happened in the immediate aftermath. Um, But, I mean, Patti LuPone kind of has a lot of feuds. She's not very... um, She's very outspoken. Yeah. Um, So she kind of starts shit a lot, which I love about her. she's like a New York kind of personality. Yeah. She just says what's on her mind. Yeah. Who cares, you know? Um, Because she also had... Who cares? um, Right before this happened... Uh, she had right before the movie was made. She had a falling out with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh, really? Yes. I did not know that because uh, she originated the leading role in Sunset Boulevard okay. on, in West End. Ah. Uh. And she just assumed that she would get the role when it went to Broadway, and they gave it to Glenn Close. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting because Glenn Close's name popped up as one of the. Uh, actresses they were considering for this role, and I was sort of like, Glenn Close, really? Yeah. But that makes more sense now that I know that Glenn Close does have a musical theater background. Yeah. Um, Norma Desmond is the character. Okay. Probably sounds I've never familiar. Seen, I don't know. I've never seen Sunset, Sunset Boulevard. I'm not. Uh, all I know is that one song. So they they had basically a falling out or feud for like 20 years, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago that they like she performed. Don't cry for me at Arge- Don't cry for me, Argentina at some event and they made wow. up or something. Okay, but I heard that she's never even watched the movie. She, I, I don't know if she has or not, but she claims. To, so, the quote from her, she was on of all things, she was on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. <laughs> no, I think that's great. I, that makes sense to me, and I love it. I mean, because I mean that show, everyone's drinking and it's trying to spill tea, and she, he gets the best guests. Yeah, and he gets them to. It feels it's disarming. It's like. It's like if you guys have ever watched Graham Norton, that's my favorite late night talk show. Mm-hmm. And it's a BBC show. And he brings out like four guests at a time and they're all drinking. Yeah. And so, yes, it like gets people to talk more. It's more fun. Yeah. And, and both Andy and- Cohen, I think they get like way more drunk than they do on Graham Norton. Yeah. So, <laughs> they're doing know. shots. <laughs> yeah. They do shots and there's only two guests. So uh-huh. there's prime time for drama. Yeah. Um, and I guess both Andy and Graham are like very disarming and uh, easy to talk to, and you want to tell your secrets too. I guess I don't know. So, in 2017, he asked uh, Patty Lapone about Madonna, and he, and she said she's a movie killer. <gasps> she she said she's dead behind the eyes, <gasps> doesn't have charisma, should oh. never be on the stage or on film. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Let me let me look at the... that. Is intense, right? That is a lot. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I mean, I understand why Patty is mad, but like this was. A, I mean, she what, never like twenty, thirty years later. She never <laughs> Not would thirty, but close. I mean, yeah. I mean, this. I think the. I think that she was on Broadway and like. In like either the late seven something like you know the she, early eighties. She would never it was have. The early 80s. She would never have gotten this role. But she also, I can see her being very protective of the role. You know? Sure. Um, let me see. I can find the exact quote here. I mean, I will, I, I'll go ahead and chime in that it must have been extra frustrating for Patti Lapone because her vocal coach wound up being Madonna's vocal coach. Oh, wow. Yeah. For the movie. And Madonna said that like there were days where she would be going in. She'd do her lesson, and she walks out, and Patty Lapone is waiting, or vice versa. Like Patty Lapone is leaving as she's coming in, and it was very awkward, and they never talked to each other. But no, Patty said the the one time that Madonna ever talked to her was in an event, uh, an event 
for Evita the movie, and all Madonna said to her was, "You're taller than me." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's what she said. She said, Madonna is a movie killer. She's dead behind the eyes. She cannot act her way out of a paper bag. And she didn't stop there. She should not be in film or on stage. She said, she's a wonderful performer for what she does, but she's not an actress. Wow. Which I think is patently wrong. I, I have to say... After this movie, after this movie, mm-hmm. I disagree. Yeah. I went into it with a ton of skepticism. I went into it asking myself, asking the universe, is Madonna an actress? Yeah. I mean, is she? Is she really? And I still asked that question about Lady Gaga. But anyways, yeah. uh, with Madonna, I, I think up until this movie, the only role I'd seen her in that I thought was... Okay. I, I mean, I not just okay. I thought she was fine in it. I didn't think much of it was a league of their own. Yeah. You know, she's like, great at that role in that movie. I think. Yeah. I mean, she's, I think if she she's has, great. I think that this it's so weird that Patty Lupone would say this because I feel like if Madonna ha- does have anything, it's like presence. You know, and Madonna did have a lot of flops though. Totally. And she wasn't considered. And I think even after this movie, she's not considered like an A-list actress. Right. She is considered an A-list performer. Right. Although she's gotten really weird Mm -hmm. in her 60s. Yeah. Yeah. She's... She's kind of leaning into it, which is fine. Doesn't she have like a like 29-year-old boyfriend or something? I think she does, yeah. Yeah. Get it, girl. Whatever. (laughs) I mean, she still looks great. Yeah. Um, but anyways. I mean, I think that it's undeniable in this movie in particular. I mean, uh, her presence and not being, like, dead behind the eyes is, like, what sells her in this movie is... She did a good job in this movie. Yeah. She really did. Um, it's funny, though, <laughs> that that's Patty's quote about her. I found this old episode of... I can't remember what it's even called. It was just like an MTV movie special mm-hmm. where Kurt Loder visited the set of Evita and talked to Madonna. Oh, wow. And um, he asked her about Patti LuPone. Yeah. And she said... So this oh, was I, like 96 or something? Yeah. it was. Yeah. Well, it was probably 95, right. 95, 96. Yeah. Um, and she said, well, I've, ne- I've never met Patti. But we have the same vocal coach, and I'm always so intimidated when I when I know that I might run into her. Yeah. But um, I've never met her. But she told our coach that she thought I would do a good job, and Kurt just sort of was like, "Okay, okay, yeah, if you say so." <laughs> like not the I drama imagine, I was looking for. But I can just imagine the coach being like, "Yeah, she thinks you'll do great." <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. No, Patty loves you, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I we both agree Madonna did a great job in yeah. this movie. And, you know, as far like, w- where she started as a singer before this movie, like, you wouldn't have thought of her as a singer. You know what I mean? Huh. She was always very much a performer and, you know, an innovator as far as pop music goes. But I never thought a of her singer, that way. But a singer... No, not really. Really? Yeah, I, I never thought of her that way. I've always thought she was a talented vocalist. Mm-hmm. But I guess I've never really thought about it either. Like, I haven't broken Madonna down in those terms. Yeah. Like, Madonna's just always kind of been there for me. I've never been, like, a Madonna head. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, she's first and foremost a wonderful performer. Yeah. Um, But in this movie... And a dancer. Sure. And this movie, I think, for the most part, sometimes her vocals, I I don't know, I felt like they were, how should I put this, everyday singer-ish? Yeah. You know what I mean? But then when it gets to the big one, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, it's beautiful. And in those moments where she can bring a little bit more humanity to it, I really appreciate it. It brings you sort of, brings that intimacy to the forefront where if, like, a Patti LuPone was in the role... I, I, I understand why they went the way that they did. If you had this huge, bro- like a huge voiced Broadway performer trying to humanize this person on the screen, I can see why they went with someone like Madonna rather than some sort of, you know, big chops. 
Well, I know this Broadway is kind singer. of like for our format, jumping ahead. But since we're talking about it already, should I go ahead and share with you some of the names that were considered yeah. for Eva? Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll start with the actresses that got like actually pretty close. Yeah. I think Meryl Streep got the closest. Interesting. And I am not going to lie. I would love to see Evita with yeah. Meryl Streep. Because Meryl can sing. She can. She can, but um, it, it all broke down during negotiations with her agent. It sounded like Meryl was asking, or I don't know if it was Meryl, but the agent was asking for too much money. And then they basically said, fine, we're walking away. But then 10 days later, Meryl reached out and said, no, I want to do it. But it was too late. They'd wow. already, yeah, it just, it didn't work out. Um, but I'm, I can't imagine that Madonna would have taken less money than Mer. I don't know. Well, it what it didn't that the timeline is really weird. Yeah. Um, basically, they were trying to get this movie made for like fourteen years. Yeah, basically, yeah, basically they had it in mind to make a movie as soon as it came out on Broadway. Yeah, I think like the bidding war for production rights started in the early eighties, yeah. and it didn't even leave Broadway until eighty six. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, it wasn't like they immediately went from Meryl to Madonna. Yeah. Essentially, when Meryl backed out, that just, like, shut things down it's just, again. It just, it's interesting to me that they, that they were looking at Meryl and Glenn Close when the age range for Ava is, like, 15 to 33. Well, and, I mean, Madonna was 38. Yeah. And she doesn't look like, like, that's something we're going to get into. She does not look 15. No. Um, that pissed me off, kind of. But other other actresses that were up for it, uh, Barbara Streisand, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. That was a surprise to me. Okay. Um, I guess she had done Grease 2. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and Margaret Scher, Diane Keaton, Cindy Lauper, weird one. Oh. Marie Osmond, really weird one. Yeah. Charo, <laughs> Catherine Deneuve. Okay. Liza Minnelli, she was very close as well. Interesting, yeah. Um, let's see. And then, the, of course, all of the, at that point in time, eight actresses had performed the role on stage, mm -hmm. and they screen taped all of them. So okay. you have to imagine that includes Patty, Patty LuPone. LuPone. Yeah. yeah. And Elaine Page. Interesting. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, Madonna wound up getting it because... She heavily campaigned for the role. Yeah. She wrote a four-page letter mm -hmm. to director Alan Parker, and she sent him a video, a music video, for her latest hit, which was Take a Bow. Right. And that video, which, if you haven't seen it, it it has this whole, like, 40s and 50s kind yeah. of vibe and wardrobe. Yeah, and very it's very cinematic. Very similar, yeah, yeah to what they ultimately did with this movie mm -hmm. so that's what sealed the deal for her yeah yeah and she was actually the one the she was actually the one that got them to be able to film on the balcony at the um what is the name of that building casa casa rosada, casa rosada, rosada. Which means the pink house <laughs> yeah they yeah we have the white, white house they have the pink house right. casa rosado yeah or no rosada i think it's rosada. rosada yeah 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 i gotta work on my spanish but yeah they they casa rosada. when they asked the when the director uh parker asked the argentine leadership to use the balcony they said no we were like you would never be able to film on the balcony at westminster abbey <laughs> or no, Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah, um, and they were like, well, nobody would want to. <laughs> so Madonna had like 30 minutes with the president of Argentina and got it, basically. She like she showed, I think it, it said in that documentary you sent me, that she like played him. Oh, that was, yeah. Played him, the, played him the clip of her singing Don't Cry For Me Argentina and he like said yes on the spot or something. Okay. Alan Parker says it's because she like showed him her bra strap or something. Oh, really? Uh, jokingly. Oh, okay. Jokingly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So Madonna is the Eva Perone. We've got uh, Jonathan Price playing Juan Peron. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Price, um, he is a veteran actor. I have to admit, I didn't recognize him as anybody other than uh, this guy from Game of Thrones, which I know you never 
really watched. No, I watched like six crazy. seasons of it. Okay, he, so he looked very familiar to me. He's um the sparrow guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, who I hated. Yeah. I mean never you were supposed to hate him on that show. Yeah. So I was kind of bummed out when I realized that he was one, but he's very good in this. Yeah, he's very good. Yeah, he did a good job. Um, and... they also fit him with a couple of prosthetics, so he's he looks much more like Juan Perón mm-hmm. than than uh, he does not IRL. And a wig. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Just real quick, we'll recap. Evita, it was released Christmas Day, 1996. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and as we said, uh, music by Andrew Lloyd Webber, lyrics by Tim Rice, directed by Alan Parker. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we all know, Alex, that you love this movie. I do love this movie, it, it, but it's... I was obsessed with the soundtrack when it came out. I listened to my favorite song was Another Suitcase and Another Hall. I would listen to it all the time <laughs> on my boombox. I had the soundtrack. Boombox. Um, so yeah, I mean, it has a a big place in my heart nostalgically. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also think it's a really. I think it's well. So it's a nostalgic really film for you. But like watching it as an adult, did you have any like? changes of opinion i definitely i mean i see obviously see the nuances of the story a lot more yeah as far as ava herself being this sort of polarizing figure and and showing her story but also showing um the opposition through che right um which is something that was sort of lost on me as a kid i mean of course it was yeah that's fair I felt uh, I had not seen this one before, and I went into it with a heavy dose of skepticism, uh-huh. mostly because I, I'm just not crazy about Andrew Lloyd, Lloyd Webber. Um, but I gotta say, like musically, this is my favorite yeah. of any ALW I've ever heard. See, <laughs> yeah, no, musically it's really good. It still has all of those like classic. I don't know all of those classic things that. That make his music what it is. Yeah, um, a little bit of cheese. It's a little cheesy. Yeah. There's so much like electric guitar, yeah. and it's a little synthy. It's very '90s, yeah. just like Phantom of the Opera is very '80s. And it was very much. I mean, and on stage, it was even more. Oh, I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine. And then I think that Tim Rice's lyrics are a little clunky. Here and there, they're a little awkward. I don't like how he keeps calling, like in this one song, and it comes back again. He calls Buenos Aires the Big Apple, and like that's not a thing. Yeah, we call New York the Big Apple, and people in South America do not call Buenos Aires. Yeah, it's not just a blanket apple. term for a big city. Yeah, that it's just because of ba. Yeah, and I, I, th- I think that's dumb. Yeah, and there were some other like iffy moments, but. Overall, I got to say, I was moved, Mm -hmm. and it's an amazing story. It is. It is such a good story, and I think the fact that she was so controversial is what makes it good. Yeah. Um, I would love to see a, like, not a modern, but another retelling of it where they go, maybe not even a musical, just where they go a little bit more in depth. Like a true, like a true, like a true biopic. Yes. Yeah. I would love that. Would that would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But what I, an interesting figure. And I think that it's such, it's such a difficult, I think that Tim Rice says this in that documentary, it's that tightrope that you're walking of this, how you have to be um, sympathetic to her because it's, this musical is about her. You have to see her, her humanity, but you also have to see like the context politically of what was going on at the time. Yeah, and and that's where I think they just could have gone a little bit deeper because yeah. that's what helps shape her as a person. Totally. I mean, she's not all good. She's not all bad. That's that's the point. Yeah. Um, but she did. I don't know. She had some moments that weren't exactly uh, indicative of being a person of the people the right. way that she sold herself. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I think that. She wasn't exactly living as she was preaching. Right. Yeah, exactly. And she, like, and her excuse for like her extravagant lifestyle was that, like, this is how my people want to see me, and I do this for them, and blah, blah, blah. This, this gives them hope that they can, you know, get out of the and out of poverty, too. And that's just her. Yeah. You know, there's still a lot to be said about her husband's politics, of which she was a big subscriber, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But no, I really enjoyed the movie. I would give it an A, yeah. honestly. Um, I was surprised to see on Rotten Tomatoes, 
it's got an aggregate score of only 64%. Really? Yeah, that really surprised me. A lot of critics at the time said that it was a glorified music video, which I just don't, I didn't get that at all. No, I mean, I think that what they're talking about is the fact. because it's sung through. Yeah, it's a sung through musical. Yeah. And I guess, like, people had forgotten about that that exists yeah about it existing <laughs> yeah. um so i mean that's interesting that it got that they felt that way about it at the time but then you know there were a lot of big critics like roger ebert and uh gene siskel they both loved it yeah so you know it was hit or miss but i i was surprised to see that i thought it would have been higher up on the uh on the freshness yeah score um, okay, so let's go ahead. Oh, I also give it an A. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and jump into the recap. Okay. Um, it opens in the Big Apple, 1952. <laughs> yes, we are in uh, Buenos Aires, and we're at a we're at a theater, a movie theater, which and this is how the uh, stage musical opens as well. And, yeah, they're watching just a romantic black and white Spanish language film, mm-hmm. and uh, it's completely packed, and then the film stops, people are angry, mm-hmm. manager runs in, and... Breaks the news that yeah. uh, Ava Peron is dead, and everybody freaks out. It's totally, yeah, totally distraught, except for our narrator, mm-hmm. Che. Mm-hmm. Um, played by Antonio Banderas, and it's worth going ahead and pointing out that in the musical, Che is... Very much Che Guevara. Yeah, which is crazy. Yeah, Um, because he didn't really... Obviously, he was a political figure in Cuba. But he was Argentinian. But he was was Argentinian, Yeah, he was born in Argentina. Right. And, um, yeah, big Marxist revolutionary, but he never he met Ava Perón. No, and he wasn't even written to be Che Guevara. Um, that was more of uh, Hal Prince's idea when he brought it to the stage. Mm. Um, and then when it went back for the film adaptation, they went back to the more, like, vague idea of what Che is. Yeah, because it just, it makes things messy unnecessarily to yeah. bring in, like, another historical figure who actually has absolutely no relation whatsoever right. to these other two. Yeah. Although I will say, um, it is said that later on, much later on, he did meet Juan Perón. Okay. But, I mean, we're talking, like, long, long after right. Ava's death. Right. So... Anyway, he's just Che. Yeah, he's just he's Che. He's Che, and he represents he represents the audience. He represents the 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 people of Argentina. Yes, and he's like a very young Antonio Banderas. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he'd had like a couple big successful roles, but he was still kind of a fresh mm-hmm. fresh faced actor. Yeah, and he's he's kind of in that role of what we've seen a lot of like kind of the Greek chorus. Yes. He was very critical of her. And going back to what we were saying earlier, I think there's room, honestly, for more criticism. Yeah. Um, that being said, I love I love this person. I and, love this and the, and the And the show needs it. Yes. Yeah. If it was just the story without it, it would be a piece it of propaganda. It would be so cheap. Yeah. And, yeah, I think audiences would see right through it. Uh, yeah. So, um we're in the movie theater. Everybody's distraught except for him. Uh, and he's, like you said, he's kind of our, like, omnipotent uh, yeah. narrator. So we cut to a funeral procession mm-hmm. in 1926. A very modest funeral procession that's obviously somewhere rural. Right. It's kind of, like, interrupted by Eva's family. Yes. And it's uh, and so Eva, who, it's kind of obvious that... Eva is the little daughter. It's kind of focusing in on this youngest daughter. Um, And they show up uh, at the gates of this church and are turned away. And we find out that Eva's family is basically her father's second family. Yeah. So, like, it's easy to grasp from this scene. But essentially, the mom, Eva's mom, was his mistress. Yes. And um, he produced a number of children with her and then abandoned them quickly. Yeah. So she brings the kids because she thinks it's their right to be allowed to pay their last respects yeah. to their father. 
Um, and there's a big argument. They don't want to let them in. I, it's unclear if it's the mom or the widow, but yeah. either way, they don't want to let them in. But Eva being very little, I think she's supposed to be about five years old. Mm -hmm. In this scene, she just runs past everybody and, and lays flowers down on his, well, it's open casket, so yeah. on his body. Yes. Um, and then is immediately, like, physically forced out. Yeah. They just, like, pick her up, throw her up. So then uh, we get this funeral, and then immediately we flash forward to her funeral procession, which is much more grand. Yes. It's um, attended by hundreds of thousands of people. People were crushed to death trying to be a part of it. Yeah. It was um, unexpected. And, I mean, it is really, it's a tragic story. Yeah. It is. And we get a song. I mean, it's just a, um, instrumental, the Requiem for Eva. But it's a gorgeous, a gorgeous piece of orchestra music i think that part of the reason i enjoyed the music in this so much is because there is i mean it's very operatic you know mm -hmm. and they bring in a lot of religious music mm -hmm. i mean like rec I mean, requiem is a yeah it's a, is that like a religious music yeah it's like it's basically like a funeral service okay yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like uh what's the other one is is there like there's a term called dirge a dirge yeah yeah, mm -hmm. is that is that? Yeah, and there's like, what like we're there's some like know. Latin chants and stuff in it too. Yeah, and, and there's just there's a lot of like choral arrangements yeah. and I, I don't know I I really enjoy that. Anyways, um, so we see her funeral procession and then we cut to Che sitting alone in a bar and he's singing about how crazy everyone is acting over her death and he's very um he's very skeptical he's yeah. very cynical and this song is oh what a circus and yeah he seems very bitter and because he says one of the lines that he says is she did nothing for years right basically i, I they she talked a big talk of, about being a woman of the people and in some ways she was yeah but in ways that he experienced, uh, not so much. Right. So, yeah, then he takes us to another side of town where people are not quite so enthusiastic yeah. about her. And, and it's mostly destruction and, mm -hmm. you know, throwing pain over her, yeah. her portraits and everything. It's kind of like rioting in the street. And, you know, that could be from mourners and opposition, you know. Right. <clears throat> um, so then we go to Janine. I think it's how you Jeanine, say it. Janine, 1936. Jeanine. Yes. Uh, so this is 10 years after the father's funeral. And Eva Duarte mm -hmm. is 15 years old in this scene, played by 38 and pregnant Madonna. <laughs> uh, yes. So this kind of threw me out. If I have one big criticism, actually, about the movie, it's that they had a 38-year-old Madonna play 15-year-old Eva Duarte. Yes. It, it, it just it doesn't, it doesn't you, work. Well, you don't really... It, it's easier to not see how creepy it is. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> For her to be with... I mean, I don't know how old Magaldi is supposed to be. Too old. Yes. Way too old. And he even acknowledges later on how it's she's... like, you're basically a child. Yeah. yeah. He says you're barely a woman, basically a child. Like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, he knows. Disgusting. Yeah. Holy... It's so gross. But uh, his hit song is very pretty on the night on this night of a thousand stars. Okay, apologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, she's in the audience. She's watching with delight. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we've just seen them get out of bed together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and he's basically singing to her. It's also seven p.m. when they're like, "You gotta get up. You gotta go." Oh, so they've just been. Having a day in bed. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And this is like one of the first times that we see other women look disapprovingly at her. <laughs> right. And she's just like, see ya. Uh huh. She doesn't give She it. never cares. She doesn't give an amp. Mm -mm. Um, so, anyways, uh, they're in the bar, and then she starts, because everything is sung, she's, after his performance, she starts singing about how she wants to go to Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. the BA, Big Apple, Big Apple. Yeah. <laughs> and he is basically prepared to walk out. He's like, no, this is a bad idea. And then the townspeople stop and threaten to report him to the newspapers for <laughs> sleeping with a 15-year-old. Right. 
Um, so I guess he, that's what makes him back down, it seems. He's like, okay, you can come with me. He doesn't want her to come, but he's she's basically decided that she's going and like... Right, because I guess he's already decided he's going. Yeah, I mean, he. This is where, I think that's where he lives. And then it's revealed that like he's going back to his family right. that she doesn't even know about. Right, so she goes back with him, but she doesn't have anywhere to go because mm-hmm. she gets to the house and he's got kids and a family and he just goes in the house and she's gone and no point does he think to tell her well you can't come because i've got children that are like five years younger than you right (laughs) (laughs) so gross yes um okay so they wind up they board the train um he he has to bring her so they board the train and uh they arrive in the ba and after stopping at a bar that's when they he takes her home. There was this line right right in here around this time about about her feelings about the middle class. Did you make any note about this? Mm-mm. It, uh, she just basically said he says something about the middle class, and she's like, "The middle class, I hate the middle class. They hated my they like from my town. The middle class were the people that hated me and my family, and blah blah blah." Well, that was probably a time where, like, A, the middle class existed, and B, um, they were very lower yes. class. Uh-huh. And the higher class, the bourgeoisie, she probably never had even seen right. before. She wanted to skip the middle class and yes. get on top. I mean, she did, but... Yeah. I mean, and in some ways, the middle class can be, like, the judgiest. Totally. You know? Because, yeah. like, they're only better because they're morally superior. Right. So then, okay, so, like, they're in Buenos Aires... Um, she realizes that she no longer has a home. So essentially, um, just, we enter a montage of her cavorting with older men. Right. And this is another suitcase in another hall, which it's this song starts with her leaving his house and sort of goes through her like procession of other men. Yeah. I mean, she looks generally unhappy, but it, it, almost as though she's treating it as a job. Yeah. Um, she eventually gets an audition. It doesn't work out. Um, I gotta say, I noticed in this one scene, so she goes into the director's office, Mm -hmm. and as she's walking out, he's, like, adjusting his tie. Was that supposed to be an implication of... But it's also obvious that she didn't get the job. Right. I know. I couldn't really figure out, like, what that was supposed to be To me, it seemed like maybe she rejected him, but she wouldn't, like, based on... The Ava that she did sh- based on the Ava that they're, they're showing us, she there was a have lot rejected. of sexual favor trading. Yes, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, anyways, maybe that's just foreshadowing what is to come. Yeah. Um, she doesn't get that job, but there's a photographer there who snaps her picture, and then next we see her with him, mm-hmm. and she winds up getting a, an advertisement. She gets a centerfold. Yeah, she lands in magazines, Mm -hmm. and she starts to have some marginal success. And then this is Good Night and Thank You, which this song is about. The the other song was just kind of her sleeping with random men, and then Good Night and Thank You is her, is actually the, like, sleeping to the top montage. Yeah, I mean, the tone of this whole montage is not that she's a victim. No. It's very much that she knows what she's doing, and she's using what she has to get ahead. Yeah. Now, that all being said, she is a teenager. Yeah. So, I... I, I, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, when you think even, like, it reminds me of, you know, when, like, the groupies from the 70s tell their stories with, Oh, my like, gosh. We are not going to get into we this. We don't have to we get into We are not going to get into this. But, like, you know, they tell those stories with fondness, even yeah, though it's no, obviously I know. wrong. I, I mean, know. Yeah. We've talked about... Yeah. <laughs> David Bowie and yeah. what's her name a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> we're not gonna get into that. We don't have to get into it. Okay. So, anyways, um, she's having some marginal success. Mm-hmm. Uh, she gets some radio gigs. Yeah. And she works her way up through the ranks of society, mm-hmm. and that's when she notices, like, oh, military guys. Yeah. That's who I need to focus yeah, on. These they are the have people, the power. Yes. Yeah. These are the people that will get me where I want to go. And so she's she, and she's famous enough at this point to have like people are taking like paparazzi are taking her pictures and stuff. Right. And so she's and she's an it girl. She's enough of a star that when um so basically there's this huge earthquake that happens in Argentina and 
Peron, who is not, what is he at the time? He's like well, a... Well, but before we get to the earthquake, there is a military coup. Yes. In 43. Yes. And that's where Peron comes in. It's the G-O-U, and I forgot to look up what that stands for. Mm-hmm. But anyways, uh, uh, yeah, chasing's about how the tank and the bullet rule as democracy dies. So mm-hmm. there's the military coup, and then, meanwhile, she's becoming an actress. Yes. Also, BT Dobbs. There's a director cameo. You know I love cameos. Oh. The scene where she's being a bad actress, yeah. essentially, the director <laughs> in that scene is Alan Parker. Oh, yeah. interesting. Isn't that fun? That's cute. I love it. <laughs> uh, but yes, okay, so then we meet Colonel Juan Perón. Yes. And there is a massive earthquake in San Juan, yes. which in real life killed over 10,000 people. Jesus. It was big, yeah. yeah. So he takes this moment to come to the rescue, which is, a, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming mostly a political move. Um, yeah, and, the, the earthquake created an opportunity for him. He right. sets up like a concert, an aid yes. concert. Yes, he has this huge charity event, which one person that's invited is Ava. And also her former beau. Yes, Magaldi is there yeah, singing Ag- his one Agustin, song. Agustin, Agustin Magaldi. <laughs> Um, they run into each other later, and she says, your act hasn't changed very much. And he says, neither is yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, she, but again, she was a child, so yeah. eh, I mean, shut at, the fuck up. At this point, well, this is 1944, so this is... She's like 23 Eight years now. later than, yeah, 23, yeah. 24, so, uh, you know. I know, I know, <laughs> different time, blah, 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 blah. So, um... She, I mean, she does, she it did come to this event with somebody, but when she meets Juan and they sort of have this connection, he's like, are you here alone? She's like, yes, yep, here right. alone. <laughs> and he says the same thing, yeah. but he's obviously not. Right. Yeah, they have basically set their sights on each other. They immediately leave together. Mm-hmm. And, she... and he makes a huge stirring speech at this uh, at this event about the government needing to represent the people. And right. What, you know, the things that they... Talk about a lot going it's a Look at what the people have done tonight. Yes. And we need to represent you, the people, because you are the people that get things done. Right. Um, they leave together, and, I mean, before we know it, they're moving in together. And this, and because this night that they have, she basically has this song, I'd Be Surprisingly Good For You. And that's the gist of the song. She just keeps saying, like, I'd be good for you. Yeah. And basically, she's she's saying, like, we are going to have sex tonight, but that this isn't a one night stand. Like she is like setting up this as an allyship, a partnership right. between the two of them that will be mutually beneficial. I think they go to her place first, but like immediately after, she's moving into his like palace essentially. Yeah, and she literally like goes into the bedroom and kicks out his current girlfriend. Yeah, which sucks. Yeah. I mean that's that is rough. And then, sh- That's and then, pretty the, harsh. and then the girlfriend is the one singing. So what happens now? Yeah, it's and, pretty and, harsh. And, and Ava's like, "Shut up, go, don't ask anymore." But Bye. spoiler <laughs> alert: that woman probably avoided a terrible death because Juan had HPV. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Which is probably how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll get to it. Yeah. Okay, so um. Ava and Juan, they're living in the in the palace. Uh, mm-hmm. Next, we see them at a polo match. And mm-hmm. this is where we gather that the elites, the bourgeoisie, they are not impressed they're at all. They're all whispering in hushed tones about her. Humble. Yeah, they don't like her humble beginnings. Mm-hmm. Um, they say they wouldn't mind to see her at Herod's behind the counter, but never in front. Right. Um, the military guys on one side are not impressed either. Mm-hmm. They think that she's far too ambitious. She should just stay in the kitchen, stay in the bed. Stay in her lane. Yes. Yeah. And they're they're worried that she's going to influence those politics, which, I mean, she ultimately did. Yeah. But, but she immediately, even before they, should they get married, she is out doing political work for him. She's on the radio yeah. Speaking out. She's in the streets marching with him. I mean, the way she just knew how to naturally do this, mm-hmm. she was always meant to be. Yes. I think a politician or in front of a crowd in a way that's I don't wanna I don't wanna diminish being an actress, but even she says later on, like 
she can't she can't do what she needs to do as an actress. Yeah. She can't just entertain people. She wants to change things. Yes. Yeah. And I think I don't someone in that in that documentary said it is like this is her greatest stage. Basically. Yes. Yeah. So um she and Juan are strategizing how to move forward and she's like things are going to fall apart, things are going to go to chaos. You're going to wait for that and then you're going to swoop in. So she's like planning Sit and wait, yes. bide your time. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, and she says that, like, once things fall apart, you can, quote unquote, reluctantly accept the president. Right. You know, the position as president. Yeah. Um, and then, then, he's, he's, a, and then like, he's immediately arrested. Well, no, but before that, and I think this is important. Oh, yeah, he says. We could go to Paraguay. Yeah, we can run away. We could be happy. I could find good work there. Yeah. And, and we could just be happy together. And she's like, absolutely not. Yeah. That is not what I'm here for. Yeah. It's not what you're here for. We're going to change things. Right. Um, and who knows how, I mean, how historically accurate that was. I, I But this agree. is portraying it that I it's agree. her ambition that is keeping them going. Because one thing that we kind of skipped over earlier, uh, Che alludes to this when he introduces Juan, mm-hmm. um, but this is real in real life. Uh, Juan Perón was a big fan of Mussolini. Like, he went to Italy mm-hmm. to meet and study Mussolini. Yeah. So he, like, probably didn't have ambitions to just, like, move to Paraguay and be a simple, like, farmer right. or whatever. Right. I'm guessing that wasn't on his agenda. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, what, one thing that this movie and this musical doesn't really illustrate is what Juan was actually doing. Right, because it's not about him. <laughs> right. But, yeah. And, again, that's why I think another retelling of this story could yeah. be really good. Yeah. Um. Anyways, okay, so, yes, they do arrive home, and that's where members of his own party have arrived to arrest him. Yeah. Um. I guess he's just getting too successful yeah. for them. Mm-hmm. So he's arrested. The people rally in the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the song A New Argentina. Yes. And she's out campaigning for him, basically, um, saying that he's for a workers' regime. Um, and she's using her working class status to prove that. What is the line that she says? Well, he, she says, It's that like, then how would, then if why it would weren't he... true, how could he love me? Exactly. Yeah. If he didn't love you, he couldn't love me. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and it's, it's a convincing argument, Mm -hmm. quite frankly. Uh, she gives her speech to the people and, um, oh, she also says she found her salvation in Peron. Mm -hmm. Uh, let him save them as he's And so she's kind of introducing Peron as an idea. And this is what creates Peronism. Peronism. Yes, Yes. Which is still a political ideology in Argentina. It is. And it. It alarms me a little bit. Mm-hmm. It does because is it that different from Trumpism? Well, it was I very. Mean, in that, did like, you they get to the part in that documentary? People. Did you get to the part in the documentary like whose favorite musical this is? Oh, stop! Donald Trump. Stop. And stop. guess who was very much inspired by it? Margaret Thatcher. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I did. No, I did see the Margaret Thatcher yeah. part. I did not get to the Donald Trump part. Yeah. He saw it six times on Broadway no. when, it, when it came out. Yeah. I mean, but that's not shocking, It's right? not. No. It's really not. I mean, they're getting the wrong things out of the musical. They uh, are. And, and now, to be fair, like, I... Before I even got very far into the musical, I was thinking, like, I definitely see signs of Hillary Clinton, too. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying... To be clear, I am not equating Hillary Clinton with Donald Trump uh, at all. Not at all. It's just it's just but indicative it's of American politics. Well, yeah, it's political aspirations, yeah. and and it's it boils down to what this whole movie is about, what she was about, which is, uh, did the uh, ends justify the means? Right. And she would say yes. Yeah. And a lot of politicians would say yes. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of normal people would say no, they do not. Even you in are that psycho. Even in that interview that they had in the stock, there's basically there's a documentary. Um, it's on, yeah, the it's BBC on YouTube. Documentary. And they talk to, like, the modern-day Peronism leader in this documentary. And, and the interviewer is like, basically, do you think that, like, what, what they did to get where they were, do you think that that was... And he says, it doesn't, oh. matter, it doesn't matter what they did. Yeah, I remember that. He's like, it doesn't matter what they did. What matters is what they, 
the what they inspired in the people or whatever. Yeah, and that is essentially what it's about. Yeah, yeah, it's populism. Yikes. Okay, uh, so where were we? So basically, she's out in the streets campaigning for him, and at, at a certain point, the government is like, we can't keep him in jail anymore. We have to let him out. Yeah, and she says that he is resigning his allegiance to the military, and mm-hmm. now that he, he stands with the... Um, now he stands with the... I want to say it's Descamisitos, which oh, I yeah, think translates... The shirtless ones. Yeah, yes. to the shirtless ones, or just... Poor, poor people working yeah. poor. Mm-hmm. Um, and notably, at this point, it kind of looks like Che is, he's with Eva. Mm-hmm. Like, he is one of the working poor. So he's, like, marching right next to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, those, he's not become disillusioned And yet. those paths can, you know, ideologies can cross in different ways and, you know, different times. Sure. Um, so they, so then they're... Once he gets out of jail, they're pretty much immediately married. Yeah, fun historical note. Um, in real life, they were married mostly in secret. Mm. There are no photographs of it. It seems like a small ceremony. The in only the... person in attendance was her mother. Mm-hmm. And then um, I guess they got married by somebody else because one of Juan's like favored clergymen was there as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, it was a very secret wedding. Um, but that's neither here nor there. They had already been acting like spouses anyway. You know. Right. I mean, she was already, yeah, in the public eye for yeah. sure. So then we cut to Che singing about, um, well, this is where he starts to bring up uh, some negative aspects of how they approach things politically. He mm-hmm. sings how annoying they have to fight elections for their cause, essentially saying like, oh, it's so unfortunate that you have to win a popular vote in order to get in power. Mm -hmm. And they show us that the way they overcome dealing with that whole, you know, little annoyance is essentially through violence. Mm -hmm. Um, I I mean, like anybody that opposes them, they send the armed like military police out to break up the rallies. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, later on, we even see... I think it's later on. It may actually. I mean, even be during the this scene, once, but like once he's in power, I mean, the whole movie is interspersed with these scenes of them repressing, right? Uh, you like know, at military one point, repressing. They're like people. breaking. They're like arresting journalists yeah. and destroying the newspaper offices. Yeah. you know, um, and this is where the controversy really comes in, and and this is where I again say like we could go more in depth. Yeah. Um, yeah, their practices were very, uh, what would you call it, like totalitarian? Totalitarian. 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 (laughs) Totalitarian. And totalitarianism. Yes. Yes. And a lot of people think that that's exactly where it would have gone if she hadn't died, if he hadn't been removed from power later on. Possibly. Um, but basically, he's, he, wins. He's ele- he wins the election. Either, you know, on his own merits or not. Yeah. Um, and he's giving us first address from the balcony of the Casa Rosada. Mm-hmm. And uh, he big says, thing, we're all workers His now. big thing is taking off his jacket, and they love it when he does uh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's what they all do today. You got to roll up mm-hmm. your roll up your sleeves. This is how I'm a man your, of the people. That's right. Yeah. I'm ready to work. Yeah. Ready. Yeah. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, before he finishes his address, though, he brings out, Ava, Mm -hmm. he knows how big of a deal she is Mm -hmm. with the people. And he brings her out. The crowd loves her. And this is where we get the big one. Don't cry for me, Argentina. It's a beautiful song. Yes. It is truly a Uh beautiful song. And one of the interest, one of the very interesting things that I saw in that documentary was um, what Elaine Page said. One of the directors or writers told her when they, when she was in rehearsals, for the show, which was, this is a political speech. You can't be get wrapped up in the emotion of it because it's calculated. Hmm. Which is a very interesting. That is very take. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So she would sing it very like just straight. I mean, it has to be calculated emotion mm-hmm. rather than 
Mm -hmm. rather than genuine emotion. But of course, like, isn't that a common criticism of successful women, that they are calculated? Yeah, absolutely. That everything about them has just been made up. Mm -hmm. They've got a team around them. And I I mean, to be fair, she did have a team. Yeah. And and I think most, like, rich people, who are often successful people, (laughs) do have teams. They've got stylists. They've got publicists. They've got... And Agents, as, as much as this, everything. and as much as this movie sort of ro- romanticizes her, it also does her some injustice, as far as the way it portrays her as this sort of conniving. Like you would never. But wasn't she in a little? She was a right, little but, bit. But, but those same those same qualities would never be put onto a man. No, not especially not in, you know, 19, whatever. I think we're in like 45 or 46 yeah. at this point. Yeah. No, absolutely and not. And how it, how it but, p- portrays her being sexually active and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't take away from the fact that like she was purposefully yeah. working her way up through the ranks. Right. Again, I'm not, how, it's how not necessarily exactly, something to be criticized, right. but it, it was there. And how exactly this movie, uh, it's hard to tell what the movie's stance on it is if they're just presenting it if they're looking down on it if they're saying it's you know it kind of just presents it as what it is i mean at the end of the day she and this is alluded to or or addressed outright she is an actress but she's a better actress in front of the people yes she's a better actress when she's saying something that she you know from what I gather, she, she believes, believes in. in. Yeah. yeah. But she is putting on a show. Yeah. She's a great orator. Yes. She gives good speeches. Yes. And so they decide, we need to send her on the road. Yeah. So she goes on a European tour. Yeah. And uh, right before we get to the European tour, uh, we just get more glimpses into how she really is living a quite grand yeah. lifestyle. Um, there's a line about the people adore me, so Dior me. Yeah. Um, meaning put me in Christian Dior, put me in. Oh yeah, that's you know. a little bit later on. Um, but first, I mean, there's this line that she says where she promises. It says that she promises to take riches from the oligarchs and give it to the people. Oh and yeah, as though she hasn't like, stoked the flames enough. Right, yeah, it's like actually saying that she's going to take their money and spread it around. Yeah. Um, they mad. And it also shows the scene that she and Juan are living in separate bedrooms. They don't really have much of a romantic life anymore. Well, okay. So I didn't take it that way. I took it differently. Okay. Um, I, I genuinely think that they were in love. Absolutely, yeah. But in that scene, I think it was more to do with his... <sighs> His own ego. I think it was more about him being a little bit worried that she was starting to take the reins a little bit. That she was starting to, uh, you know, she was the face of their movement, not him. And I think that insulted him just a little bit. So, Because, you know, you see him... He turns the handle of the door to her bedroom. Because this is, you know, back in the 40s in in a palace that they have different bedrooms. And he turns the handle and she sees it and she thinks he's going to come in. But then he decides not to. And I I took that to mean he's... I I think that was just his own... He's um, pulling away because he's A little threatened. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I took it. There are so many parallels here between her and, like... and. Princess Diana. There are. In, I, I agree. That was another figure that came up for me, came yeah. to mind. I mean, obviously very different people, because I truly think that Diana's intentions were pretty pure. Well, she was the the, the people's princess. Right. And in this movie, they call her the people's savior. Yeah. You know, it's the, the same sort of leader. thing. Yeah. yeah. But sort of had the same sort of grip on the public. They both had, you know. I think the only difference is I can't think of a single negative thing that Princess Diana did. Yeah. Whereas oh, there, yeah. there's definitely some um, things oh, abs- to talk about with absolutely, Eva. Absolutely, yeah. yes. But what they sort of represented was similar. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but so they do decide that she's going to take a tour of Europe. Mm-hmm. And they call it the Rainbow Tour. Yes. And... Um, 
she initially has great success. She Mm -hmm. goes to Spain first. She draws crowds of, you know, over Mm 45,000, they say. And like you said, that it's showing like she's perfecting her image. Like all of this is about what is the line? It's like hair, nails, face, right. makeup. It's like, yes. And importantly, on this tour, and maybe because she had the look right, I don't know. But importantly, on this tour, she secures an ally for Juan in the form of a General Franco mm-hmm. uh, of Spain. Yeah. And and so it's a big deal. And so like now she's kind of starting to win over the military guys. Yeah. Because like she's doing a good job. Yeah. She's actually uh, benefiting them uh, politically. Mm-hmm. But then she goes to her next country, Italy. which is Italy, and she does not get the same reception. They don't like her. They do not like her because they equate Perón, rightfully so, with Mussolini. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're unimpressed. And even the Pope, she does get a sit down with the Pope. So that's a big deal. But all he does is, what is it? (laughs) Well, I guess it's insulting to her that she only receives rosary beads from him. I guess um, culturally he would give bigger gifts Mm -hmm. to people that he found of higher importance. Right. And she got rosary beads, which he pro- it's probably like going to the White House and getting that box of M&M's. You know what I mean? Like They, they have White House M&M's uh-huh. that they give out to all the children. Yes. And it's probably like that. Or like getting a pen uh-huh. that says like the White House on yeah. it. Everybody gets this. She didn't really have an audience with the Pope. She like met him like anybody would. Right. He was polite, but that was about it. Yes. Um, she next goes to, let's see, I think it's France after that. Mm-hmm. And at first all goes well, um, but that's where she starts to feel a little ill. Yeah, it says She's that, at a play and she collapses. Yeah, it says that she, I don't know, remember who says that, but they say that she's lost interest and she's starting to fade. Um, and she is seeming a little bit weak and yeah, she, she actually collapses. So it's, something is definitely starting. Yeah. So they cut the tour short, and she comes home, and they they say, well, we have to make it a grand return home to make it seem like everything's fine. Yeah. And she plays the part. She's still exhausted, but Mm -hmm. uh, she is there to sell that the tour was a great success. And, uh, you know, by most accounts, it it was. Um, I think the, the military guys are now starting to feel, again, a little iffy about her, but they're like, eh. It was mm-hmm. fine. It was fine. Everything was fine. Yeah. And uh, she starts giving away a lot of money. And this is where it's sort of, I don't know exactly what's going on, but she has a charity organization that she's moving money through. Okay. So, yeah, when she returns from Europe, and this was IRL as well, she starts, that's when she starts the foundation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you see her like literally just handing out money yeah. off of the train. She, Opening hospitals. She did like, real work. Yeah, yeah, they open hospitals. She secured Lots clean of ribbon water. cutting. Yes. Um, she wound up creating like a new feminist party within the, the Peronism party. Yeah. And ultimately, I don't even think they show this in the movie, but she did get women the right to vote, yeah. which was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think that it's called Pardito Feminista. Pardito Feminista. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, with the charity, there's a lot of controversy there as well, because you kind of get a glimpse of this in the movie, but it appears as though she's taking wages from the working class to mm-hmm. fund her charity. Yeah. Now, granted, uh, they put some of their own money into it, and they got money from the oligarchy as well. But generally speaking, like she did, by all accounts, like she did take money from the working class, and it's up for debate whether or not she asked them to do that voluntarily. And even if so, was it truly voluntary when they're like threatening people with like police batons and guns and all, I mean, and all this also, rest? I mean, this is another thing that has a weird sort of parallel to Trump, where you're like funneling money through the Trump organization, or right, yeah. And there are a lot of questions about where did that money go, yeah. and. I will say, like, today's uh, historians, there's a lot of detractors who will say that 
no, she didn't. She didn't illegally funnel money. Yeah. But there's just as many people that say, no, she really did. Yeah. There are funds unaccounted for. Yeah. Some people say she opened a Swiss bank account. I mean, uh, as much as she was spending all of this money, you know, doing all these good things, she also was spending a lot of money on herself. And they're and the kind of people wealth. to say yeah. it's the ends to the mean. I have to look this way to be appealing. Right. This is like, it's like this is a write off because it's part of like this has to go to me because this is part of the organization. <laughs> what is a write off? <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, this is part of the organization. Do you know what a write off is? <laughs> I love Shit's Creek. Um, okay. So fold in the cheek. <laughs> Um, all right, so she's back. She's taking people's money for, for right or wrong. But it is true, ultimately, that she is genuinely helping people. Yes. Yeah. So after this, we cut to her announcing that she's going to run for vice president. Yeah. Alongside her husband, who will be running for re-election as president. Mm-hmm. Um, because unlike here, uh, it's two separate votes. Yeah, and she... This is where Juan sings the song She is a Diamond, which is him basically trying to convince the politicians that this is a good idea. Right, because they say she's out of her depth and, and this is beyond question. Mm-hmm. This is she's gone too far. And his last line to them is she's the one who's kept us where we are. And as he's leaving, they say back to him, She's the one who's kept you where you are. Which is true. It's true. It is true. Yeah. So Juan's advisors know essentially that she's necessary yeah. at this point. Yeah. And they but importantly they also know that she is the only reason why he's still in power. Yeah. And they wonder if he knows that. Right. And I at this point I wonder too. Yeah. I'm really not sure. I mean this doesn't really explain like I said the the, the movie and the and the show doesn't really explain what he's doing. It's very much saying what she's doing politically, but you don't know exactly what yeah. he's up to. And just to reiterate, I'm into that. I'm glad it's a movie about her, yeah, but I'm same. just so curious same. about the rest of it. Yeah. Um, but unrest is continuing in the streets and also in Parliament. Yeah. And it's a huge recession. There's huge unemployment. Yeah. Um, People are striking. Their, their Journalists gold, are arrested. Their gold stores are diminishing. Yeah. Unemployment is soaring. Uh, inflation is soaring. Mm-hmm. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. And there's a song called Santa Evita that's happening, um, which is, I think, what the children's choir is singing while she's going into It's basically about her being Saint Evita, Saint Eva. And she's going into the church for the service and taking communion, and she collapses again. Right. Yeah. And she's this rushed. one is much more public. Yeah. Uh, and I and I want to say before she's rushed to the hospital, um, while she's receiving communion and she collapses, she's carried out to the car. And then, like, Che is there singing, like, why try to govern a country when you be- can become a saint? And I'm like, whoa, dude, that's a little hard. She's, yeah. like, basically wishing for her to die at that yeah. point. Yeah. I thought that was too much, too much. Um, but anyways, yeah, she's but rushed to the hospital. She doesn't die yet. Someone, I don't remember who, some expert in this documentary was talking about um, if Ava would have known what her cultural impact would be now based on her death. Oh yeah, I saw would that. She, it was the West she, Side Story. Yeah, story would guy. she choose to li- to live or to die? And he's yeah, like, he she would said. He said basically, yeah. There's, I there, think that's bullshit. He said that she would have chosen to die. That's <laughs> that's freaking bullshit. Nobody yeah. would just like choose to die at thirty three. Yeah, she. Yeah. No, could give me a piece of, except for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> So moving on. <laughs> um, okay, so okay, Eva's rushed to the hospital where they perform. It's not disclosed what happens in the movie, but this is some historical notes. Yeah, it was a hysterectomy. Yeah. Now, in real life, they didn't do that in the hospital. They did it at the Casa Rosada. Yeah. And she, because it was the 1940s, the late 1940s or early 1950s at this point, 
they never told her. Yeah, Juan knew, but she didn't. Yeah, they never told her that she had cancer. She had cervical cancer. Yeah. Uh, it was caused by, it's widely believed, by HPV. That because, she got from Juan. Yeah, because his first wife also died of cervical cancer. Yeah. So, I mean, put two and two together, it equals cervical cancer caused by HPV. Right. Um, so, she's in the hospital in this scene, but in IRL, she's in the Casa Rosada, and this is what's really messed up, or one of the things that's really messed up. Um, she specifically, she was told she had to have a hysterectomy, but not told that it had to do with cancer. Yeah. Now, what they told her, I don't know. I mean, she knew that she was bleeding a lot. Right. So, she believes that she's going to re- receive surgery from a very uh, pronounced uh, Argentinian doctor. Yeah. In actuality, I mean, that doctor was in the room with her as she sedated, and then another doctor, an American doctor who specialized in oncology and cervical cancer specifically, comes in to perform the hysterectomy only after she's sedated, wow. and then he leaves before she wakes up. And they just let her believe that the Argentinian doctor did the whole thing. Ugh. I know. I know it's really messed yeah. up. Like yeah. how little agency she had. Yes. Yeah. And and this is one of the most powerful women in all of South America. Not and she world. still yeah. didn't have any control over her own body yeah. and health. Yeah. It's mind blowing. Yeah. It, yeah, it's 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 crazy. Um anyways, uh, <laughs> that is such a bummer, but while she's sedated in the movie In the movie, she enters a dream sequence. With her actually interacting and having a dance and singing with Che. Yeah. And this is where he he basically just, like, levels with her. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how long do you really think this is going to last? Like, how long can you keep up this whole, like, I'm a savior, I'm a person of the people, Mm -hmm. I'm here for you, when... The only way you're achieving it is by stepping on and attacking your opposition. Right. Um, She responds by saying what we've repeated a number of times. Like, this is a way to justify... Mm -hmm. Or these are the means to justify the end. Um, Basically, she was reiterating, this is what I actually believe. This is... I'm doing what I think is right. Yeah. She says, I didn't write the rules, but I know how to play the game. Get off your high horse. Yeah. And so this is, I mean, this is a subconscious thing. So we're led to believe that in her subconscious and in her heart of hearts, she actually believes that what she's doing is the right thing and what she's doing is is morally correct. And I, I, I think she does. I yeah. really do. Um, she's also, I mean, you have to look at where she's coming from. Yeah. She probably didn't have the greatest education. I'm not saying she's unintelligent. She clearly was very intelligent. Um, But she was young. She was young. And she left home at 15. Yeah. And, I I mean, she did the best she could for for the card she was dealt, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Anyways, back to the movie... Oh, I was going to say, yeah, go ahead. Just a note here, musically, Madonna sounds great during this song. I during agree. The, during the Eva, I and, mean, she sounds really good the whole time. Yeah, but she like, really does. She's singing very forcefully in the in the Eva Che waltz, and it's just she sounds great. Yeah. So I agree. Yeah. Oh, there's one other line I really love from Madonna where she says, "Better to win by admitting my sin than to lose with a halo." Mm-hmm. I mean controversial but yeah. she delivers it very very well yeah we go back to real life or mm-hmm. real movie life and juan comes to her bed and this is where he finally i mean he tells her yeah. in the movie he finally levels with her that she's dying it's 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 not clear whether he says exactly he doesn't what's he going just says on. you're dying yeah. and she's just like okay <laughs> she says your little body is slowly breaking down yeah well then she, i mean he outright says you're yeah, dying. Ava, you're dying yeah Yeah, and... um, And I started crying here when she went back to... She calls back to that line. It's like, where am I going to? And this is where she sings, You Must Love Me. 
Okay, so this was the original song. This was the, yes, this was the Oscar bait. The obligatory original song to get that award. And you know what? It did. Mm-hmm. It sure did. And it, it, I think as far as these original songs go, this fits perfectly into the music, I think. I agree. Um, you well, wouldn't, I mean, you, it you helps. You wouldn't know tonally that it was... A new song. If and it helps that it was written by the exact same people that wrote the original. Yeah. You know? So, like, it was probably something... I'm not saying this happened, but it very well could have been something that they kind of thought about putting in the original draft, and mm-hmm. then they took it out, and they didn't tell anybody, and they said, nope, this is original for the movie. And it was probably written with Madonna in mind. Yeah. It's, I agree. It's not a very challenging song. Ouch. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, there are some parts that the uh, that are high and wow. but she sounds great on it though. Yeah, she does. Um, okay, so they return home after the song or during the song, whatever. Mm-hmm. And at this point, she can't even really walk on her own. She's noticeably thinner. Yeah, she's, she's mostly confined to the wheelchair. She comes out of the hospital in a wheelchair, so people see her like this. And then he carries her up the stairs at their house. And then. Um, she is escorted out to the balcony to give one last address to the people. Mm-hmm. One more historical note, which is so sad. Um, in actuality, when this happened, she wasn't escorted by a person. Um, although at one point, there are pictures of her where like her husband is like literally like holding her up. But I think in with this speech in particular, um, there was like contraption made essentially that like braced her it was almost like a like a cage yeah with an open front Uh um like a like like you'd put a doll on yeah yeah to help that's a metaphor i know (laughs) i know right oh god that's good it's yeah i mean that's that's a painful image to to uh come up with or to imagine it's so strange how in politics how much physical weakness is frowned upon yeah well i think that has been the case um in recent years for some people Mm -hmm. um I don't think that Donald Trump, like, making fun of disabled people helped Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Or him, like, I don't know, or his supporters, whoever it was, saying, like, Hillary Clinton's dying. Yeah. You know, they say the same thing about Joe Biden. And it's just like, oh, my God. Yeah. It's just uh, physical weakness has always been viewed as the country being weak. FDR was in a wheelchair. Which was very, very heavily guarded. He, they weren't they weren't very open about that at all. Hmm. They very much tried to make it seem like he wasn't. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I guess it was easier back then. Yeah, with less uh, media. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Anyways, yeah, so, it's a huge bummer. Um, at, at, during this speech, she announces that she is declining all honors and titles. Mm-hmm. She is content to go on simply as the woman who brings her people to the heart of Peron. Mm-hmm. And this is basically her withdrawing as a candidate for vice president. Yeah. So sad. Um, and she says... She is she's Argentina. Basically sing- yeah, she's basically singing a reprise of Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. And she says... Though it may get harder for you to see me, I'm Argentina mm-hmm. and always will be. Yeah. I'm it's crying really, at this point. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know. No, I, this is where I started to tear up a little bit, too. Yeah. Uh, we cut to mourners gathered outside as she is on her deathbed. Yeah, they're she's holding vigil by, at, outside, of the, out of, outside of their house. Yeah, she's surrounded by her husband and her family. And... Um, at this point, I think we we don't see her pass. We no. just flash forward to... And we to... do talk... She does show her talking to Juan in yes. his final moments. And she's trying to make him feel better. And she and she's like, what would 50 or 60 or 70 years be when I've already accomplished this much? Oh, it this... just killed me. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I hated that. Yeah. Oh, so sad. Because I, I don't, I don't, I still, I don't believe that anybody would just be like, yeah, 33 is enough. Yeah. I think that's just a way to make peace with what's happening. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? And that was her way of 
making him feel better, you know, and, you know, making herself feel better too. Sure. And whether or not she actually would have, of course she would, wouldn't have wanted to die. You know, it's. Right. Like, I mean, ridiculous. that's just insane. Yeah. I hate people that say that. Like, you've clearly never been dying. Yeah. <laughs> or around somebody that's been dying. Who's, like, like trying to make peace with it. Of course they're going to say the things that are going to make them and the people around them feel better about right. it. Right. You know? Yeah. Anyway, so she dies. Um, do they do they actually turn off the light in the, in the apartment to show that she's gone? Oh, that's not so. something I took note of. No. Uh, we cut back to, we flash forward to the beginning of the movie, yeah. which is her, um, you know, it's her wake, essentially. Mm-hmm. She's in a glass top coffin. Yeah. So that people can see her one last time and pay their respects. And I think importantly, the most important thing that happens in this final scene is that Shay is there and he actually bends down and he kisses the top of the coffin, you know, where her forehead is. Yeah. And, you know, I I have to question, why did he do that? And, and in my mind, it was because I think he almost pitied her. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it was necessarily a sign of respect. I mean, maybe a little bit. Yeah. But I think it was more about... I, I don't know. Maybe respect is the right word. I think he was trying to say, like, I do think you tried. You failed. <laughs> yeah. But I think you tried. Because he's so critical of her the yeah. whole movie. He's not a fan. No. But no matter the circumstance, she, like we were talking about, she did. She the, did she, make real changes. And she did the best that she could for what she what she believed was right within her circumstances. Sure, like had she had other people around her saying like, mm, maybe you don't need to spend all this money mm-hmm. on jewels and diamonds and uh, clothing right. and cars and, you know. Uh, but that's still a problem in with women in politics is it doesn't matter what the man is wearing. A woman will always be criticized for spending too much money on her clothes or caring too much about how she I looks. I don't or, care, do you? Right. <laughs> No, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's very complicated because she's controversial in her own right. And then it's controversial because she is a woman. Yeah. And then it's controversial because she's a woman in the 40s. Yeah. Where it's like even more and these difficult. Theme, and these themes of women being criticized for being too ambitious or spending too much money on clothes or caring too much about how they look and all this stuff. These are all things that are still happening, you know. 70 years later. And there was nobody there saying, Ava, be careful. I think Juan's ambition is dangerous. Right. Which, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that his ambition was dangerous, but his penis was. (laughs) Very much so. Yes. He killed two His His pubic area was dangerous. Yeah. uh, Shout out to Gardasil. (laughs) Go get your shots so that you don't get cervical cancer from HPV. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the end of the movie. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so unceremonial in this discussion. Yeah, I mean, she dies, and it, it dies very... <laughs> that's it. The movie just kind of... Now, there is out. one last moment that I... The, I I'm i curious about your thoughts, because I didn't really know what to make of it. In the very last scene... Um, Chasing so he, into Juan basically. Yeah, so like Che, he kisses the coffin and then like Juan is like staring daggers Mm -hmm. at him and I wasn't sure what that was about, to be honest. Like, was it because he was mad that a that a somebody of the opposition was there? No, I think that I think that in that moment Che was representing what he always represented in this movie. He wasn't just himself. He was the people. Right. But then why was Juan so, I don't know, he seemed pretty mad. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. We'll have to ask Alan Parker. (laughs) I mean, and so Che is singing his lament. And he's, I mean, he's singing with bitterness towards Juan as well. He says to him that he doesn't have to depend on her for his own gain anymore. Right. Maybe that's why he's angry. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways. I mean, I think this is supposed to show the friction between just Juan the two and the people. political factions. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and then that's how it ends. Fa. Yeah. Fa. 
<laughs> um, this, Finished. So there is like this crazy story about what happened to her body after she died. I mean, she, <laughs> what? she was embalmed for viewing... Um, and have you ever been to an open casket? <laughs> have you ever been embalmed? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been to an open casket funeral. Yeah, yeah. Both of my uh, on my dad's side, my grandparents were open casket. It I don't weird. Yeah, I th- I don't I don't particularly love it. I don't think that it's. I think it's an old fashioned kind of thing, like where. Um, we didn't have as many means to photograph people mm-hmm. as we do today, so it was kind of important to get that one last look. Yeah, and I mean, it's this, it's, I don't know, it's this sort of, like, Victorian morbid death It is, where they used to, like, set people up in a room for, like, a week. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, she was available for viewing for years. Okay, so tell us what happened. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't want to get into, like, the whole story, but basically, um... She was in the house or the palace or something up until um, Juan Perón was overthrown in the government. Right. And he fled without her body. And it kind of went missing for a while. And then it showed back up again and it was shipped to like her hometown. And then it was shipped to go be buried next to somebody out like it was like shipped around a whole bunch and i think that it actually ended up being she actually ended up being just like laid to rest yeah, in her hometown she's in argentina now but like okay so when you oh say... yeah she's in no yeah she's in um she's in the duarte family tomb in buenos aires so like when you say that she was in the casa rosada until Juan fled how long was that? Like, how long so, in between her dying and him leaving? Because he eventually came back, but it wasn't until the 70s. They were making plans to construct a huge memorial in her honor that would be larger than the Statue of Liberty. And she was to be stored <laughs> oh, in the gosh. base of the monument and in uh, the tradition of Lenin's corpse to be displayed for the public. When the monument was being constructed, Evita's embalmed body was displayed in her former office at the CGT building for almost two years before wow. before the monument to Eva was completed. But Ramon Juan Perón was overthrown in the military coup in the revolution in 1955, and he fled. So this was so three, three years. three years. Yeah. Wow. And he was unable to make arrangements to s- secure her body. That's a very, like... European. Um, well, this is South America. I don't know. Maybe it happens further south too. But like, and then so from 1955 until 1971, the dictatorship that came in issued a ban on Peronism, and it's it's unclear where the whereabouts of her body for these 16 years, hmm. which is crazy. But in 1971, the military the military found out that Evita's body was buried in a crypt in Milan under the name Maria Maggie. What? Uh Uh-huh. It appeared that her body had been damaged, compressions to her face disfigured in front of one of her feet as if she'd been left in an upright position. Uh Uh-uh. There were a bunch of myths and rumors about what happened to her body. Like, this, I had actually heard this, and I thought that it was true for a long time, that someone had been keeping her body and, like, defiling it. Ooh. Um... How but did you hear that? It was like a rumor that was going around. It was in this. It was in like a book that was a f- fictionalized work. Or was it just like gossip around town? <laughs> did you hear? <laughs> no, like I think it was part of this book that is a fictionalized work and about so the ex- like about the quote unquote the escapades of the cor- yes, and it became widely sure. believed yeah. when it wasn't. I mean, we don't know exactly what happened happened to her body between 1955 and 1971, but there's every reason to believe that it was just in this cemetery in Milan. Um so then Fair enough. F- finally um it was her body was returned to Juan. He died in office in 1974 and that year the terrorist group Montonero stole the corpse of Pedro Eugenio Amburuo. Who's that? Whom um, had also they had also previously kidnapped and assassinated. God, they killed the person and then took his corpse. Yeah. Holy moly! And then they used the captive body of him to pressure for the repatriation of Eva's body. Jesus. <laughs> so then, Juan's third wife Isabel, 
who had been elected vice president. Oh, no. He married another woman. Uh, Did she die of cervical cancer? <laughs> it doesn't say. Oh, gosh. But she was elected vice president with him. Wow. As Ava wanted to do. And then succeeded him as president and had Eva's body returned to Argentina to be displayed beside Juan. Wow. So I guess she had some reverence for her as well. Yeah, that's actually really nice. Yeah. For, you know, the later spouse to have that kind of respect. Uh, Although I'm sure she was like everybody else that loved Eva Perón. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so many people still do today. Yeah. If you, I mean, in that documentary we were talking about, uh, from the BBC where she's walking around Buenos Aires, uh, there's just figures of Eva Peron everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. I mean, uh, handmade ones and mm-hmm. paper, papier paper mache. mache. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then actual statues and so on and so forth. And then that whole, like, Evita themed bar that they right. went to. <laughs> So that that's all pretty morbid, and I have another morbid fact okay. that I have to share. I don't even I, – I really wasn't sure how to transition into this because it is so sad. Okay. But essentially, um, there was, like, a guy that worked uh, for Yale. He's, like, a Yale scientist – Think his, I think his name is Neil Jensen, but it's like Norwegian, so I don't know Jensen. how to pronounce it. Yeah, I yeah. don't know how to pronounce it. It starts with an N, and then it goes to J, so I'm not oh. sure what we do there. Okay. I think it's, yeah, Jensen. We'll mm-hmm. say Jensen. Anyway, so he actually was able to pull up x-rays, um, scans of her brain, and oh. other, you know, all all of her other medical records. Yeah. And he talked to people um, that were involved in this procedure. Yeah. It is now widely believed that she was given a lobotomy. Yeah. Two weeks before she died. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a number of theories as to why this could have happened. One of the leading theories is that it was a way to address her pain. Yeah. Back in the 40s and 50s, when this procedure was Mm semi-popular, it was mostly applied to women. Yes. uh, Women that were either too emotional or too anything. Yeah. It was sort of used as like a... Sedation effect. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case... There is a theory that says, well, maybe it was done because she was in such agonizing pain Yeah, from the cancer and from the treatments. I, I think she was receiving some form of radiation, like she early was actually, radiation. Yeah, she had a very early form of chemotherapy. She's one of the first people to get chemotherapy. Right. So, and, and I think we all know today that makes you incredibly sick. Yeah. So she was in extreme pain. And they thought that the lobotomy would, if not ease her pain, it would make her able to deal with the pain emotionally. Mm-hmm. And by that meaning, like, she wouldn't have emotions about it. So I'm not sure why they think that would help with pain. But yeah. anyways, yeah, that's one theory. The other theory is that in her last month, of living, her her rhetoric was getting very very strong. Yeah. Um. In fact, from her deathbed, she ordered like, and I think it's like fifteen hundred automatic weapons, <laughs> and and more that she wanted delivered to the working class. Oh. So shit. like she was getting pretty extreme Radical. in her last days yeah. and 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 that's up for debate too was it because her mind was slipping is it because she knew she was on her way out and she wanted to have a you know this was going to be your last impact yeah. this is her last stand uh, i mean yeah. we'll never know but because of that the next theory is that one was very fearful of a civil war developing because of her own rhetoric so he ordered the lobotomy and again this is not a procedure she consented to right she she i don't think she even knew it was happening yeah but it did happen and um it was two weeks it happened to the day two weeks before she died 
And she stopped eating after that procedure, which is most likely what led to her actual death. Yeah, it said that she was like 79 pounds when she died or something. Yeah, like yeah. cancer is rarely what actually causes the death. Mm-hmm. Um, it's usually side effects of the cancer. But in this case, it's some people believe it wasn't the cancer. It was the lobotomy. Yeah. And subsequent starvation. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so dark and it's so scary. And it's uh, I mean, this is just a good time to remind everybody why uh, it's really important to women or for women to, to have, have access to their own health care. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so that's really dark. Let's move to something else. Okay. <laughs> um, I have some other, like, I, ha- I have some other movie trivia, I think. Mostly about casting. I have a really, really funny casting consideration. Yeah. Okay, this is going to blow your mind. I have a hard time believing this is real, but I read it from two different websites. Okay. Um... One of the persons considered... Actually, I'll give you two people considered for the role of Shay. Okay. Uh, the first one is Patrick Swayze. I could see that. Yeah, I could see that, too. I can see that. I think they made a right choice by having at least a Spanish-speaking actor yeah. in the role. Mm-hmm. Um, the other consideration was Elton John. <laughs> Okay. I love Elton John, but come on, come on. I mean, one of the Give things. Me a break. One of the things that they said in that documentary is that the role of Che is they've always kind of given it to like a pop or a rock singer. It's sure. Yeah. I mean, I know Ricky Martin did it yeah. on Broadway for a little while for the role of Juan. I didn't see a ton of names that were pushed forward, but Jeremy Irons was one of them. Okay. And I could see that. I really yeah. could. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I think I might have preferred Jeremy Irons in this role. He's a great singer. I you guys might. Sing. Yes, you have. He's oh, Scar. Oh, right, 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 right. He's Scar in The Lion King, and right. he's very good. Be prepared. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's pretty. Come on. He's pretty good, right? Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Sure. A couple other little little trivia bites about the filming of this movie. They shot on location in yeah. Buenos Aires, as we said earlier. And the people were upset, right? They were not pleased. Yeah. Um, but it but it was it was almost the same way that the Argentinians treated Eva Perón. Uh, half of them loved it, half of them did not. Yeah. But in this case, it was more of a generational divide. Right. Uh, the older generation thought that Madonna was just a travesty. How yeah. dare they? And then the younger generation treated her like she was, you know, the g- biggest thing to ever come. Right. And she, And maybe she was at the time. Um, I bet it's like there are videos of her entering like the lot, the filming lot, and people are swarming the car like it's, you know, like the Beatles, essentially. And I had read something about how like the extras that they casted to be in those huge scenes outside the Casa Rosada are like actual Argentine people. So I think actually they're not. Oh, okay. Those are people, they were from Hungary. The extras were shot in Budapest. Oh, okay. And then the her like, scenes were shot in... Okay. Yeah, the Casa Rosada. I guess that must have been and like then, a piece again, of they lore only, that I heard. Yeah, and again, the only scene that I could... I think, I think the only scene that they were able to shoot the uh, at the Casa Rosada was Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. I think yeah. every other balcony scene may have just been you know, like a, a replica. Yeah. yeah. Not only Madonna's casting, but her supporters in Argentina were against the musical itself in general because they thought that it portrayed her in a negative light. Yeah, everybody except for, like, the the youths. The youths were thrilled, but everybody else was very concerned. Mm-hmm. Um they had to do like a press conference yeah. a couple days after it was announced to just sort of like try and try and tone down the rhetoric that was spreading around. And I'm assuming that and then the, the paparazzi re- were crazy too. Yeah, I'm an, I'm assuming that the reason that Madonna wanted to show the president her performance of "Don't Cry for Me, Argentina" was to show that she was playing it with heart, heart, and, and empathy. Conviction. And, yes, exactly. yes, I think so too. I think so too. 
Do you want to talk about the awards really quick before we sign off? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, it, like I said, it pretty much swept the Tonys that year. So what year was that? That would it have was been... 1980. The Tonys of okay. 1980. It won Best Musical, Best Original Score, Best Book of a Musical, um, Best Performance by a Leading Actress, went to Patti Lapone. Um, oh, and do you know who originated the role of Che? Uh, okay, hold on. Was it... Was it Colm? Nope. Um, was it... Screen actor. Screen actor. Okay. Uh, was it... No, I don't know. It was Mandy Patinkin. Oh, gosh. I, I feel like I could have gotten there. That's so good. That's so good. So he won for Best Performance by a Featured Actor in a Musical. Um, there was another actor, Bob Gunton, who was nominated but didn't win. Um, Harold Prince won for Best Director. It won for Lighting Design. Um, and then it did not win, but was nominated for scenic design, costume design, and choreography. Okay. All right. So all the, pretty much most of the major categories. The most important ones. Yeah. Okay. So for the movie awards, mm -hmm. we have uh, the Golden Globes. They won Best Original Song for You Must Love Me. Mm -hmm. They beat out Because You Loved Me from Up Close and Personal by Celine. Mm -hmm. uh, they beat out For the First Time from One Fine Day. They beat out I Finally Found Someone, uh, which was a Barbara Streisand song from The Mirror Has Two Faces. And then this one kills me. They beat out That Thing You Do. Ooh. From that thing you do. That's tough. I it is. I mean, I feel like you have to give it to the Avita song. Yeah. But like, come on, that thing you do is so good. Brilliant. It's so good, and I feel like it's very underrated. Do you? Because it's like a pop song. I found out a crazy piece of trivia yesterday. Okay. That in the original director's cut of that thing you do, which is like forty minutes longer. Okay. There's a lot. I mean, there's some more like backstory about. Tina, the girlfriend, Charlie Theron, and blah, blah, blah. But one of the things, this really short scene, basically is saying that Tom Hanks' character is gay huh. in the movie. Okay. It shows him, like, meeting up in L.A. with uh, Howie Long. <laughs> Do you remember Howie Long as a football player who's in the, those commercials with, um, what's her name from Desperate House, what, with uh, Terry Hatcher? I, I mean, cut. Yeah, 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 yeah. The guy, yeah, he had glasses. Yeah. He had rimless glasses. Kind of like and... a high and tight yes, like, military yes, haircut. Yes, yes, yes. So he was like this guy, like, you know the scene where a guy gets drunk and comes back to the hotel? Uh-huh. So basically Tom Hanks is trying to leave with Howie Long in this convertible. Oh, and, 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 and guy is drunk and blah, blah, blah. And, and Howie's like, Howie Long. And Howie's huh? like, should we take him with us? And he's like, no, he's got blah, blah, blah. It's like... <gasps> Should we take him with us? Okay, that goes from just like being there's a scene where we know he's gay to there's a scene where he is a uh -huh. partier. Yeah. Okay. And he's that, like, no, we should not. That he's definitely saying. changes things. Wasn't that movie directed by Tom by, Hanks? Yeah. yeah. Mm, love him. Yeah. Love him to death. Who doesn't? Okay, so more awards. Okay, more awards. Uh, it did win at the Golden Globes for Best Motion Picture, parentheses, musical, musical or comedy. Which, when you when you hear these nominations, I think you'll agree, like, it just doesn't really... They gotta stop because separating when, movies yeah, this way. Yeah, because when they put, like, a huge drama musical in the same category As, with... As, for example, The Birdcage. Right, or, I mean... Even something more way stupider than that, like it'll put it next to like you know, <laughs> Minions two or you know, it's like <laughs> okay. Well, Minions just came out. <laughs> um, no, it, it beat out the Birdcage. Everyone says I love you, and then these last two are actually I think big big wins. Yeah. For um, Evita, it beat out Fargo and Jerry Maguire. Those were in the comedy category. Yeah. But I'm sure they were both nominated. Isn't that messed up, though? Yeah. I'm like, I would not have put Fargo in comedy. Yeah. I mean, it's a little funny. It is funny. Or it's Jerry funny, Maguire, like, really. I, I know. I know. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, Madonna did win for Best Actress. Again, 
musical, musical or comedy. comedy. Yeah. She beat out. Now this is ridiculous. She beat out Glenn Close for one hundred and one Dalmatians. <laughs> Okay. I know. She, this is a big one. She beat Frances McDormand mm. for Fargo. I mean, that's kind wow. of crazy to me. Yeah. Some people th- still view that performance as like, as one of the one best of, the of best. all time. Yeah. I know it is. Uh, she beat out Debbie Reynolds for Mother and she beat out Barbara Streisand for, again, the Mirror House Two Faces. Huh. Fun fact, Courtney Love was also nominated this year in the drama category. So we had like two big sort of, um, you know, what was Courtney alternative Love in this year, stars. In that year? Uh, the People versus Larry Flint. Oh right, yeah. yeah, that was like her first role. Yeah, and then she did um, what two hundred cigarettes and well, I don't know. I've never job. seen her in anything. <laughs> Um, so, oh, but, uh, uh, again, just, like, real quick note, very importantly, Courtney Love, um, (laughs) she didn't win that category, but she was nominated next to Meryl Streep, who also didn't win. Who won? Uh, Blenda Blevin. Oh, for, um... Secrets Online. Yeah, I remember seeing that movie. Yeah. Okay, so, Antonio Banderas... He was nominated for Best Actor, but he lost, again, musical comedy, mm-hmm. he lost to Tom Cruise for Jerry Maguire, yeah. which makes sense. Um, and then Alan Parker was nominated for Best Director, but he lost to Milos Forman for People vs. Larry Flint. Also nominated was Joel Cohen for Fargo, Scott Hicks for Shine, and mm-hmm. Anthony Minghella for The English Patient. Oh, right, English Patient. For Academy Awards, it did win Best Original Song. I think we established that earlier. Mm -hmm. It was nominated against, again, That Thing You Do. Uh, For the first time, uh, I finally found someone. And then Because You Loved Me, the Diane Warren song Mm -hmm. from Up Close and Personal. Um, Mm -hmm. It was also nominated for Best Cinematography, Sound Editing, Art Direction. It didn't win any of those. Uh Uh-huh. And then, just, uh, I mean, for me, surprisingly, there were no BAFTA wins, none at all, and none, no nominations for acting or directing. So, I mean, really, the only time that the actors were recognized was at the Golden Globes. Yeah. Weird. I know. I know. For Madonna to win that and then not even get nominated. So, I, I, I think that's all I've got, actually, for... Awards. There are a couple MTV Video Award nominations, yeah. but they didn't win those either. Yeah. Um, Heartbreak. So basically, the only Oscar it got was Best Song. Yeah, it's, which is a common thing that we see. I feel like lately there there ha- there aren't as many like ending credit blockbuster singles that that are written for movies it used to happen so much in the in the 90s like every blockbuster had the ending credit song that was going to get nominated for the oscar you know what right I mean? yeah it's that's a good point i'm gonna go home and and actually look this up because i'm interested to see what are the songs that win these days i mean i know that like all the james bond songs always that's get always nominated nominated yeah. but those are opening credits yeah um, and that's been a thing for as long as James Bond has been around. Yeah, it's always had to have a big, yeah. Yeah, and these days, I don't know, I just go to a lot of Marvel movies, and you just sit through the credits waiting for the post credit scene, because mm-hmm. that's the thing they do. Yeah. Um, so, I think we're pretty much done. Um, I, 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 <laughs> pretty much. We didn't, we didn't really do any sort of recasting for this, but what I would like to see is not this movie get remade. I would like to see what you were talking about yes. as far as like an actual like biopic. biopic. Yeah. Yes. Biopic? Biopic? <laughs> Topic. Um. <laughs> no, me too. Uh, somebody else, not that they did a bad job, but somebody else needs to tell her story. Right. And also, I would say Juan's story. I'd like to know more about him as well. Yeah. Um, I agree with keeping the focus on her because she's awesome. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, like, I think she is a role model. Mm-hmm. And I say that not knowing that much about the controversy. I know a little bit. She's a role model in the sense of how much she accomplished. 
Absolutely. Uh, and at such a young age. Yeah. And it is so, it's so tragic how yeah. she died at 33. And whether or not we <laughs> agree with with exactly the things that she was. The, the means. The message. Yeah. yeah. And the message and the means, what she did was pretty incredible. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Um, well. So next time we'll be. Um, bopping into the 2000s oh finally. My gosh. Do you want to tell them what we're doing? I don't even know. What did we decide? Chicago. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Chicago. Yeah. Catherine Zeta Jones, mm-hmm. Renee Zellweger. Yeah. And Richard Gere. And Queen Latifah. Oh, that's right. Christine Baranski. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So we're going to have fun. I'm with in that. for a treat. Yes. Okay, well, I look forward to that. We'll be back uh, when we're back. And don't forget <laughs> uh, to follow us on social media. Um, pretty at much just Instagram. At The, the Hills, Hills Are Alive, Alive Pod. Pod. <laughs> um, and thanks, as always, to We Own This Town. If you like what you hear, feel free to leave us a review. Give us a five-star rating or whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye. My headphones are sweaty.